Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Monkeys and Playbills, the podcast that Tim Burton does not want you to hear. Unless you're me, because I will be maybe complimentary. Hi, I'm Jillian Willems. Hi, I'm Paul DeGers. This is Monkeys and Playbills, the show where we discuss Broadway productions that had runs of 100 performances or fewer on Broadway, not counting previews. And what the heck happened? This week, we are going to address the musical... Big Fish by Andrew Lippa and John August. Can you think of a Tim Burton movie less appropriate for a musical? Maybe Edward Scissorhands. I was going to say Mars Attacks. No, that would be great. <laughs> okay, because it's enough. like campy, <laughs> right? Yeah, totally. Like a nice little off-Broadway thing. Yeah, like an Evil Dead situation. It's also worth noting this is our first podcast that we are doing not in the same room. We're doing our part. We're staying home for a couple of weeks because things are a little shaky in Winnipeg right now. And y'all should too. It is a little strange to not be in the same room as um, my friends to celebrate, to dissect this show. But I'm excited to give this digital programming a try. Absolutely. I have my glass of wine. Yep. I have my, uh, I have my scotch. Cheers. Cheers. Let's dive into Big Fish. Previews began at the Neil Simon Theatre on September 5th, 2013. It opened on October 6th, 2013, and it closed December 29th, 2013, after 34 previews and 98 performances. 98? I know, it almost made it. If they'd held on... For two more days, we wouldn't be doing this show right now. (laughs) We wouldn't be talking about it. Oh, gosh. All right. Let's get into it. So, as you said before, music and lyrics by Andrew Lippa. Yeah, I think we're going to have a lot to talk about this episode. (laughs) I'll give a synopsis just before we launch into who wrote the book. Terrific. So, the synopsis that I found on Theatre Rights Worldwide is the following. Based on the celebrated novel by Daniel Wallace and the acclaimed film directed by Tim Burton, Big Fish tells the story of Edward Bloom, a traveling salesman who lives life to the fullest. And then some. (laughs) Edward's incredible, (laughs) larger-than-life stories thrill everyone around him, most of all his devoted wife Sandra. But their son Will, about to have a child of his own, is determined to find the truth behind his father's epic tales. Incredible. I think that's accurate. I don't want to get into my opinion too much yet. So I've seen the musical now. I've never read the novel. Neither have I. And I've seen the movie a couple of times. I watched the movie for the second time just this past week in preparation for this, the Tim Burton movie. What do you think of the Tim Burton movie, Jill? So I watched it for the first time ever a couple of nights ago. For the first time. Yeah, I'd never seen it. I remember when it came out because the images, the stills from the film are striking and, yeah, yeah. you know, very easy to remember. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't compelled to watch it really until this week. <laughs> Fair enough. So so uh, David and I rented it. Yeah. And I really liked it. And I don't know if I'm just sentimental and it it sort of reminded me of like, my dad's a bit of a storyteller. He spins these, you know, wild tales. And I think I get that side of myself from him. So I think I felt particularly connected to it. And also I tend to maybe lean toward more of the sun, uh, Will, as a human, just like realism and yeah. So, <laughs> So I think I kind of really enjoyed it in seeing those different sides of myself and, and my dad as well. I agree completely. I love the movie. It's, uh, it's really nice. I love that it talks about storytelling. I think as, as theater artists, we, the nature of storytelling is something that we think about a lot, the way that we're telling stories to audiences, the, way, the different ways that we can get audiences to enjoy stories. Mm-hmm. So just as, as an exploration of storytelling, I really love it. And as an exploration of the relationship between a father and a son, I really like it, there, especially on this on this last pass. Um, I was just bawling towards the uh, mm-hmm. towards the end of it. I was crying a lot. There was something that hit me specifically about um, at the very end when 
the uh, the son I know. breaks the uh, breaks the dad out of the hospital for one, or yeah. in, like, t- or tells the story of breaking the dad out of the hospital for one more adventure, and just the idea of let's take one more adventure, let's give give it one more shot, hit home right now at this time where we don't we're not necessarily getting to have the adventures that we want right now mm-hmm. in our um, in our careers in our lives. At least the thought of one more one last adventure, one last story hit me hard in a very positive way. It felt cathartic. It felt beautiful. I was like, man, I love that movie. What a great movie. Yes. And there's also something amazing about watching this son, like, start to understand his father enough to give him that at the end that is really beautiful. Absolutely. And I can't wait to talk about how this movie is similar to and different from the musical adaptation. Absolutely. I can't wait either. Okay, let's talk. (laughs) <laughs> Let's talk about the book. Let's talk about John August. John August. Famed screenwriter of Charlie's Angels. <laughs> Charlie's Angels full throttle. No. Yep, I, I swear really? to God. <laughs> Big Fish, The Corpse Bride, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. No. Oh, yes. <laughs> one of these things is not <gasps> like the other one. <laughs> wow. What a, what a variety. (laughs) What a variety. (laughs) I don't even... (sighs) Okay, is he good at his job? (laughs) Sorry, I just, like, sometimes I wonder, because, you know, you don't want to pigeonhole yourself. You want to stretch yourself creatively. But it sounds to me as though he maybe never found, like, exactly what he was good at. So he just sort of tried, like, so many different things and was hoping, okay, the next thing I try is going to be the thing that catapults my career and fulfills me artistically. I don't know. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to judge him on his whole career, but we are kind of tied into comparing at least his work, his work as a screenwriter to his work here because mm-hmm. he wrote both the screenplay for Big Fish and the book for the musical Big Fish. Yes. I think a lot of what he's written, there's no question, is kind of summer popcorn-y fluff. Um, I, th- I don't think you'd, uh, you wouldn't have many people arguing with that about the two Charlie's Angels movies or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think the screenplay for Big Fish is real nice. Yes. And I don't like the book for this musical at all. I agree completely. Okay. I think as a screenplay, it's beautifully structured. I think some of the changes that they've made, and I say they, but I think I more specifically mean John August, mm-hmm. made as far as the plot in the movie versus the musical. There's a, a few things that they twist or omit in the musical adaptation, and I actually don't like that. Just before we started recording... Jill said some things that maybe implied that we have very different opinions of this musical, and I couldn't tell if she was joking or not. So I wasn't sure what she thought of the book, so we'll see. Just wait, though. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think that the the choices he makes in adapting the novel and the movie to the stage are one one of the biggest challenges with this musical. I think we're diving right into what I identified as the biggest problem. Mm hmm specifically in a show about stories, in a musical about stories. We spend almost a half an hour in the first third of the show not telling any stories. Yes. It's like setting up a certain thing. It's like they were not wanting to ostracize the Broadway audience. like So they wanted to be able to say, don't worry if you haven't seen the movie, you can still come see this musical. Yeah. But... In doing that, I think it actually, like, made made it worse. <laughs> I absolutely agree. I think what touches me so much about the movie is the fact that it's about a father who's dying and a son who's trying to reconcile a complicated relationship with his father. They seem to take three extra steps and about 45 minutes of stage time to get us to that point when I can actually start enjoying the musical. Right. Yes. Yeah, I agree. There was a very specific plot point that... I think was missing from the musical that I love about the movie. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. The movie opens with this fishing scene, right? This prehistoric fish, this big fish. (laughs) And... (laughs) (laughs) So it's a a large large fish. It's it's on the large large size. (laughs) Is an appropriate adjective. Okay, so (laughs) it is this big fish 
And the story is like he uses his wedding ring, sorry, Edward, the father, uses his wedding ring to catch this fish that no one is able to catch Mm -hmm. on the day that his son Will is born. Yes. That is the start of the movie that kicks us off. And it also helps us end this movie without giving too much of it away. But I think it's an opportunity to button it with this big fish again, right? Yep. Same river, the river theme, the father-son fishing thing. I think we can give some of it away just in the in the hope of, if you haven't seen Big Fish yet, if you haven't seen the movie, pause the podcast right now, go watch Big Fish, come back, because the movie ends with Edward dying, and in the story that his son is telling of his life, Edward turns into the fish. Yes. And it's this beautiful idea of all stories are circular, everything repeats itself, um, nothing ever ends. Mm-hmm. Your story as your legacy. There's so many great themes to be drawn. Absolutely. Now, I might not have been listening super hard, <laughs> but I don't think the musical uses that at all. No, no, it doesn't. I'm laughing at I may not have been listening super hard because as I was watching, watching this last night, watching the Broadway bootleg of this last night, I texted you and I was like, I feel like I've been watching for five hours. Yeah, it and I was does about feel like that. two thirds of the way through the <laughs> musical. <laughs> And I think that's a fault of the book. I think so. I really think so. Because I love the dialogue in the in the musical. I think the dialogue is really smartly written. I think there's a lot to work with. Yeah. But I think the plot is what frustrates me the most. Because yep. I love that um, imagery of this big fish. <laughs> yep. And it's kind of the name of the show. And so you would think that they might use that one thing. Absolutely. But... Anyway, I think I'm just a bit sour about that. Yep. It's not to hit the nail on the head too hard, but it's worth doing because, like I said, this is, at least for me, the biggest problem with this show that we're getting to right off the bat. Mm -hmm. The movie has all this beauty, all these stories that are full of whimsy. And so at the end, when um, his son is carrying Edward to to the water in the story that he's telling, all the people from his life have joined him at the water to see Edward off. And you're like, oh, there's so all this cool cast of characters, this incredibly exciting cast of characters. The changes that um, August has made in adapting it means that the cast of characters that are standing around are not that amazing at all. It's like, oh, there's <laughs> a college student. There's a kid. Yeah. <laughs> there's a giant. The yeah. giant's cool. But you know what I mean? USO dancer number five is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so there's there's so much whimsy. That ends up missing. And I think that falls solidly on uh, John August. Yep. I think so too. So maybe let's table that for a moment. Because I think I've exhausted everything that I feel I have the energy to to (laughs) talk about regarding this. Do you want to do do a rating? (laughs) Sure. We have a scientifically proven rating system (laughs) that will guarantee your satisfaction in experiencing this musical. I wouldn't say satisfaction. It'll guarantee your... What's the good word? It'll guarantee that you will know what you're getting into. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So out of 10 playbills, how many monkeys do you give this book, Paul? Three, and that's being generous. I'd say two, adding one for a funny joke. There was a funny joke at some point. <laughs> I'm sure. I laughed. I can't remember when, but I laughed. I'm going to go four. Wow. Okay. Because I think the dialogue is good. Yep. But I think the... The plot is bad. Yep. Solid scene work. Terrible overall adaptation. Yes. Four. So, we're not sure if that was the only problem. Let's talk about whether there were some other problems. Let's get into the music and lyrics. I would love to. Andrew Lip is a very fascinating man. He was a music director before he was a composer, his path was as a uh, first as a rehearsal pianist, then as an, an assistant music director, then as a music director proper, before he began to compose. He started at the Goodspeed Opera House, which is an incredible theater in the U.S. that um, helps develop a lot of new musicals. That was where he started as a music director. Then they developed his musical, John and Jen, which is a tiny little two-person musical. Yes. He went on to write a, um, an adaptation of the epic poem, The Wild Party very fascinating story one of two adaptations of the wild party to be in new york in the same year both him and michael john lacusa mm-hmm. had wildly different adaptations 
At first, I'd been like, oh, Michael John Lacuse is a hell of a composer. His adaptation is great. Andrew Lopez is like, meh. But then I did some listening, and Andrew Lopez is really nice. There's a lot of a lot to love in Andrew Lopez's Wild Party. Unfortunately, we're not talking about that. We're talking about Big Fish. <laughs> that was kind of his big old his big old break. There's a lot of really beautiful stuff, a lot of stuff to love in the Wild Party. And he goes on from there to write bigger, more significant musicals, mm-hmm. including an adaptation of the Adams Family in the mid two thousands, followed by this. I don't want to assume about people's opinions on Andrew Lippa. But I would, if I had to classify my opinion on him, it's uh, that he's a composer who writes a very functional composer. He writes a lot of nice songs. He writes songs that are really harmonically interesting. And he writes really nice pop songs, musical theater pop songs. If I'm hearing an Andrew Lippa song at a cabaret, I'm like, all right, let's hear a Lippa song. I don't know that I'd be very excited to sit down to watch many Andrew Lippa shows. So Jill, what do you think of the music and the lyrics here? Okay. I think these are some of the worst melodies I've ever heard in my whole life. (laughs) Like, I, okay, I know Lippa to be quite hummable. Yeah. I know him to be catchy, and I kind of feel like this musical isn't that catchy. I agree. I would offer that there's one exception. There's the, um, at the top of Act 2, there's that song, um, And I'll slay the dragon, and I'll slay the dragon, and I'll put it for you. Mm-hmm. That's a banger. That's a great song. Oh, you mean, I'm gonna build a wall from Shrek? <laughs> like, that song? <laughs> <laughs> if we're doing comparisons, I also, I heard the witch's song. Um, closer to the top of the show, and I was like, Ugh. oh, it's like Andrew Lippa's um, really good song, Raise the Roof, from The Wild Party, but way worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's also that song that reminded me of that song from Lestat. Embrace it, dun dun, right? From Lestat. Oh, totally, yeah. But I think it's an act two. It's when he goes to the town to try to get them to move Ashton. Um... Start over. Start, yeah, totally. Absolutely. It's kind of the same. Really medium work at best. (laughs) It's very frustrating. I'm not sure what happened, but it's really not Andrew Lippa's best work. Okay, here's what I love, though, about the music, is I think the ensemble Mm -hmm. vocal arrangements are spectacular. It makes me want to be in the ensemble to sing those bits. I agree with that. I also agree... For the, the style that uh, Lippa approaches, for the most part, he approaches this Americana, Southern U.S. style, almost um, almost Appalachian, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That really captures the feel of the movie and the, um, the feel of the geographical era, area they're supposed to be in. Well, have I got a Ben Brantley quote for you. Yes. Oh, dear friend Ben Brantley, friend of the podcast. Yeah, he couldn't be here today, so I'm no. going to... Speak his review on his behalf. I'm sure he appreciates it. <laughs> so Ben Brantley, in case you are unaware, is charged with writing all of these reviews of musicals. Correct. And he wrote about this music specifically. He talked about how he didn't really like it. <laughs> yep. So he writes, quote, A combination of country and western strings and Broadway brass, their melodies evoke cowboy theme music of the early 1960s with lyrics by Hallmark. Oh, Ben Brantley, savage. Really cutting right to the chase there, hey? Yeah. No sugarcoating that. You know, I have trouble disagreeing is the honest truth. I know. Yep. Me too. I'd like to send a sincere apology to actual friend of the podcast, Jackie Wellwood, Aww. who saw this show live on Broadway, and loved the song Time Stops so much she had it in her wedding. Aw, that's a nice one. I think that's beautiful. That enhances the song for me because I imagine it at my dear friend's wedding, and that makes me happy. I like thinking about it like that. There's another really nice ballad, though. Uh, I Don't Need a Roof, maybe? Yeah! I Don't Need a Roof is really nice. Slay the Dragon is nice. End of list. (laughs) (laughs) End of list. So, out of 10 playbills, how many monkeys do you give 
the music and lyrics? I'm going to say five. I think that with the exception of the witch's song, which I really, really dislike, I don't think any of the music actively harms the show. But with the exception of Slay the Dragon, I Don't Need a Roof, the music doesn't help anything at any point. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jill? Gosh, I want to separate this into like nine categories. Lyrics, music, ensemble, arrangements, orchestrations, like, ugh. Um, But I would say maybe as a whole, five or six? Yeah. Five and a half, how about? Yeah. This is a five and a half, five and a half score if I ever heard one. Absolutely. Like, I don't know. For me, the barometer is like, could someone else have written this better? Absolutely. There's no question in my mind. Many of Andrew Lippa's contemporaries could have written this better. Yes. And I think we could find, I'm sure we could find someone. Like to me, because you mentioned Build a Wall and you mentioned Shrek, Janine Tesori is just a powerhouse. <sighs> yes. And I would love to see Janine Tesori's Big Fish. You know what I mean? Ooh, that would be amazing. Yeah, it would be unstoppable. Oh, I just had a thought about someone else. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh gosh. And then I lost it. <laughs> what else did they write? <laughs> we can do we can do a game. I know. I'll find it again. I'll find it. I know I will. It's in there. <laughs> Whatever, it's fine. Yes. It'll come to me at midnight and then I'll just text you. Yeah, make sure you do. <laughs> Viewers, if you have any thoughts on who would have written a better big fish than Andrew Lippa, please comment below. <gasps> I got it. I got it. It's in there. So, in keeping with the Tim Burton theme, yes, we know Danny Elfman scored Big Fish the movie. He did, and also wrote Nightmare Before Christmas music, which is a, which is a very functional, very nice musical. So, why couldn't he have done something? I would have loved to see that. I'm, geez, that brings up another point. Uh, Very, very beside the point. I wonder if Danny Elfman's even interested in writing for theater. Why that hasn't (laughs) happened yet. As an enormous composer who does write, has written nice musical scores in the past. I'd be very curious. Maybe he's like, there's not enough money in that. Like, actually, for someone like Danny Elfman, that's not crazy. You know? Anyway, five and a half Five and a half, (laughs) absolutely. Let's talk about the direction and choreography. Jill... Susan Stroman directed and choreographed this. Okay, I'm scared. I'm scared of everything we're about to say because I might end up taking it personally yeah. because I really like I her know you do. a lot. <laughs> and the reason I said that with such excitement is because your style, when I've worked with you as a creative force in the past, you're so clearly connected to Susan Stroman's vibe and her style and everything she does as a creative force. Yes. And I'd love to, like, geek out about her for a moment, if I, might, if I may. Please do. Yes. So, as Paul just mentioned, I feel very connected to Susan Stroman for a lot of reasons. And one of those reasons being that I feel she's a hist- an historian of yeah. musical theater specifically. Um, she has such a breadth of knowledge about sort of the evolution of movement Um, And different styles that she's able to bring to each show she works on. And I love that and respect it so much. And I think that's why um, she is so versatile. Yeah. So she began her career as a a dancer. She did a tour, a national tour of Chicago in the 70s. Totally. Her Broadway debut was in a a production in the late 70s, a revival of a show called Whoopi. (laughs) I know nothing about it. Um, and I know no one in it. So there we go. (laughs) Um, but I guess in working on that show, people realized that she had this passion and this extensive, uh, knowledge of musical theater. Um, she has this connection to Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers movies, and that's really evident in her choreo. In 87, she did Flora the Red Menace, which I think is Candor and Ebb, right? That's correct. I guess that was with Hal Prince. Yes. Or she worked with Hal Prince shortly thereafter. And so her big kind of Broadway break for choreo was in 1990. She did a review show called And the World Goes Round, also Candor and Ebb. From there, she sort of took off. So she choreographed for Liza's um, Radio City show. And then the big one, 92, she choreographed Crazy for You. And this is where she meets uh, Mike Ockrent, right? Yes. Yeah who she later marries in 96. And she wins her first Tony 
Yay. Well deserved. Absolutely. So then she works on Showboat, which is Hal Prince's revival. And she wins Tony number two. Yep. And then her and Mike Ockrent, her husband, work on a couple more shows together. And then he um, tragically passes away in 1999. And rather than sort of close in on herself, it seems that she just dives into her work and does like Mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff, one right after the other. And then in 2000, they start talking about the producers, um, which ends up opening in 2001. Fun tidbit about the producers that I didn't even know until a few years ago was that it's actually won the most Tony Awards still to date. So it won 12. And then most people think that Hamilton has more, but it actually only has 11 wins, but it was the most nominated show. Right. And so after the producers, she does a bunch more stuff. The Frogs, Scottsboro Boys, which we'll talk about. Young Frankenstein, uh, Bullets Over Broadway, and then, of course, Prince of Broadway, which is about Hell Prince, because they work together so many times, it just makes sense. And then my last bullet point just says, I love her, period. <laughs> <laughs> And well deserved because she's a, she's a friggin' powerhouse. Mm-hmm. If all she had done was the producers, she would be remembered as a legend. Yeah, absolutely. The way she talks about the choreography is really fascinating. And it also seems like she's involved in every aspect of the production. Like there's a short clip on the New York Times page about her watching the budget on Big Fish. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Which I'm like, yeah, I guess you would want to be aware of those things but she just seemed like every part of the show she just was like completely connected to and i admire that absolutely okay so susan stroman is rad that's the official (laughs) monkeys in playbill stance no question of that so she directed and choreographed this piece and then there was an associate director slash assistant choreo position filled by jeff whiting yeah and then associate choreography was by chris peterson so there was just a small creative team i think yeah which is kind of wonderful absolutely okay so that brings me to my point that i actually think as a show the movement and the staging are quite cohesive i would agree if i had if i had any note um and once again i'm not coming at this with any anywhere close to the level of expertise you are jill (laughs) it's that maybe there's a little bit of over choreography Ooh, yep especially let me ask you, let me frame this in the form of a question. <laughs> they do this Alabama stomp in the opening number. <sighs> yeah, they do. They take like three and a half minutes out of the opening number where they're singing about um, the thesis statement of the show to do the Alabama stomp. Where's your head at in that regard? Um, first of all, I don't think that plot point is necessary because if they would have just done the thing that we suggested, which is make it about him catching the fish in the wedding ring, we wouldn't need the Alabama stomp. But a part of me is like, oh, if I was there in person, like, I would probably love that. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm feeling a little weird about it because I'm like... The Alabama stomp ugh. itself is nice. It's got this Susan Stroman. It reminds me of, like, Guten- Gutenteig Hop Clop from the producers and shit. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's got body percussion and stomping, as the name so- would suggest. <laughs> So I guess my, <laughs> my, my only note would be there was a couple moments like that where I was like... I wonder if this is necessary from a story point of view. Mm, Yeah, I would agree with that. Really a lot of nice choreography, beautiful staging. Um, It feels like the characters live authentic moments and plumb emotional depths that are, um, that feel real good and real authentic. Yeah, I don't have a lot of criticism per se. I do think it is a bit busy. I would agree overall. Yeah. I don't know whether that's because it feels like there's so many elements at play through this production, but I think as far as staging goes, of the shows we've talked about, this has the best staging. And that's Susan Stroman being a friggin' genius. I always find that with a choreographer turned director, there's a certain um, innovative quality to the staging and the possibilities of scene work Yeah. that, yeah, sometimes choreographers really just like try different things i don't know i don't know what it is but they stretch what's possible in the scene work so out of 10 playbills how many monkeys would you give susan stroman's direction and choreography okay i think the direction is like a a nine like an eight or nine yep i think the choreo is like a six and a half seven yep we're on the we're pretty much on the same page there absolutely i'd say direction an eight choreography a seven I will bring up something that Ben Brantley said. Yep. 
So he didn't seem to love the direction in Corio. Sure. He felt like things were happening to Edward and not because of him. And I think that's a great point because Edward, the storyteller, should be the one concocting all of this. And it just seemed like he was caught in the middle of like a whirling dervish of story. So he said, quote, Not once did I feel that what I was seeing had been spawned by the teeming mind of Edward Bloom. The show's de facto theme song may advocate, quote, be the hero, end quote, of your own life, but somehow Big Fish turns everyone into a local color extra. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> to Ben Brantley, I would say, have you considered that they had a giant in this show, which was clearly two people on each other's shoulders, and they danced? So there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was rad. Yeah, Ben Brantley. I'm giving a whole extra monkey for the two people on each other's shoulders dancing. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I think we're on the same page. The uh, direction in choreo is not what uh, is not the problem with this show. Although there is one small problem in the choreo, other yes. than the fact that sometimes it's frantic. Yep. I would say that giant, the giant number out there on the road, yep. she tries to like incorporate some 80s hip hop into it. And I was like, please make this stop. Oh, sure. That was okay. So add one, play, <laughs> add one monkey for the giant. Take one monkey away for the giant doing hip hop specifically. Let's talk about the design. Yes. <laughs> Scenic Design by Julian Crouch, who did the Hedwig Revival and Head Over Heels. Nice. Costume Design, William Ivy Long, who did everything, including the Cabaret Revival, which is, I think, around the same time, maybe like six months later, and Beetlejuice, etc. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Lighting Design by Donald Holder, who did Anastasia and My Fair Lady and Tootsie and a lot of other things. Sound design by John Weston, who did She Loves Me and An American in Paris. Projection design by Benjamin Piercy and 59 Productions. Totally. And then hair and wig design by Paul Huntley, who did Your Favorite, Fun Home, and Tootsie and a couple other things. And then makeup by Angelina Avalone, who we've talked about before, because she seems to have done just a ton of makeup design on Broadway. Yeah. Um, Rock of Ages, Adam's Family, um, Tootsie. And then there's also a category called puppet design, but I'd love to know which puppets they're talking about. I was just going to um, ask. And that's by Will Pike. Haha, <laughs> like a fish. Get it? Is Will Pike the big fish? <laughs> Maybe that's what... Will Pike plays a pike fish. <laughs> In in the Alabama Stomp. There's also, um, um, there's some design by Jennifer Salmon. By... <laughs> Stop. <laughs> by William Sturgeon. I don't know. Oh, that's cute. I like that. Tuna. Big tuna. Okay. So the projection design is awesome. Oh, it's amazing. The projection design is the clear star. There is some sick projections. I agree. It's amazing. It's yeah. It just stretches what's possible. Like, this was already seven years ago. Yep. And look what they well, look what they did. I can't even imagine what's possible now. Absolutely. There is one bit, especially towards the start, where um, they're looking for the witch in the woods there. And there's some dancers who um, hit their... They hit, a, they hit a mark, and then the projections make them look like trees. Oh, yes. It's so good. But they're trees that can, like, morph around because they're actually people. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. It's some good stuff. Yep. I agree. And then when the town floods, that moment is really remarkable. Yep, absolutely. Um, we were speculating the moment at the end of Act 1, the uh, the daffodils. I I wondered about that too. This is at the end of Act 1. There's the big scene where um, Edward Bloom is trying to woo his future wife and she loves daffodils. So he brings somehow presents to her a whole field of daffodils. And they, um, they bring the scrim in so they can arrange this daffodil reveal. And they bring it up and it's awesome. Okay, here's what I think. They look to me like there's a small raked um, set piece that has flowers on it that leans toward the scrim at the back. And then they project on the upper part of the scrim the rest of the daffodils. That's what I think it looks like from the stills anyway. Yeah, I'd buy that. It looked awesome. It's so beautiful. 
But it has to be, because to me, that's the most iconic image in the whole movie and the whole story, really. Yeah, and that's done That's done very well. So out of 10 playbills, how many monkeys do you give the projections, Paul? Like, I think nine and a half or 10. Yep. Right? I agree. Okay. What about scenic design? Boo. <laughs> yeah, I'm inclined to... <laughs> It kind of feels like they ran out of money, hey? Like they spent all the money on the projections there. Yeah. Um, Susan Stroman talks about that when she's talking about the budget. She's like, oh, yeah, I always have to make the investors happy. So I'm always looking at where I'm spending the money and where I'm not, basically. So I'm like, oh, okay. Of your $14 million budget, by the way, that's what it was. Of a $14 million budget, you probably spent a million of that on projections. So I guess the set has to you know, sacrifice a little bit? I don't know. It ends up, I think this is the other thing that actually hurts the show a fair amount. Mm. The scenic design and maybe the costume design, if we can roll that in as well. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned, there's kind of this lack of, this lack of whimsy. So when we reach the end of the, the end of the show and you want to um, call back to all these incredible stories we've seen, there's nothing visually striking enough for us to be like, oh, there's that person from that story and that person from that story. Right, right. So I would say both the scenic design and the costume design fail us in this regard. Yeah, that's a great point. I would say I would have loved for maybe a less totally realistic version of the costume of costume design and set design for when we are in the story mode versus when we're in real life. Yeah, yeah. Maybe more significantly different color palettes and maybe even more like stylized designs for when we're in the stories. I love that idea. And then maybe at the very end, when we're at, very, very end, when we're at Edward Bloom's funeral and you're supposed to see the people as they were in real life, not in the stories, it can be more toned down versions of the um, hyper-stylized costumes. Yes. There we go. There's, there's the music director at the production meeting. I just got kicked out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but that's like a very simple and useful tool. It doesn't need to cost a lot of money. It just needs to be decisive. Out of 10 playbills, what would we give the scenic design? Are we putting the scenic design and the costumes together? I can, because they're the same for me. I could too. I would say like a like a four. I would say a three. The stage isn't empty. They're not naked. <laughs> Great. But beyond that, I don't know what to say. That gets us to three points. And then everything beyond that is earned. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, shoot. No, I need to go back. I want to add an extra point to the scenic design. For there's the part where... um. Um, they're at the circus and then the elephant butts come out and they do a dance. It's just like elephant's butts. Of course, you would love the elephant butts. And then they, they dance, they kind of did a soft shoe and then they all farted. Yeah. And that was, uh, A++ stuff. That was that's very funny. That's so funny. Like, that's my, one of my least favorite parts about the show. <laughs> I'm just like, that's so cheap. I'm just like, oh, I think this show just really teeters on that whole, like, is this a kid's show? Is this like a, like... <laughs> And I'm fine if it is. I just, maybe you could just tell me if this is a kid's show. Like maybe be like, there's going to be butts and there's going to be like a couple kids in it. So I don't know. I just like to know ahead of time. <laughs> I like the butts. I would like to add a monkey to my scenic design rating for that specifically. Okay. So there we go. So the lights on the butts. The lights on the butts looked great. I saw the butts clearly. <laughs> I got the joke. It was great. 10 Six, out of 10. No, 10 out of 10. <laughs> yep. I'd say eight monkeys out of 10 playbills. For the lighting. Yeah. Yep. I'm cool with that. Yep. I would like to do a special shout out to the um, like hair and wig team. Totally. Because I actually think they did a wonderful job in establishing time period and establishing um, the ages of, of the, the actors through the play. Yes. This is a challenging thing where you have Norbert Leo Butts, who we'll talk about in a second playing three different ages of character. And Norbert Leo Butts um, is, contrary to popular belief, cannot travel back in time. No, he can't. So it's just that he's the same age in all three <laughs> different eras. <laughs> and we didn't have Albert Finney. That's correct. Um, well, he is actually, he's here for the podcast, Aww. but uh, we, don't have, we don't have enough mics. I think he is dead. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Daph, can we cut that out? I mean, he might be here, though. We don't know. I think there's Albert Finney in all of us, guys. <laughs> I think the Albert Finney was the friends we made along the oh, way. I like that. That's a nice thought. I'm sorry to deviate. Yes, continue, Paul. 
<laughs> Let's talk about the performances. <laughs> <laughs> no, quickly. Hair and wig, okay. makeup, all of that, I thought was aces. Fantastic. If I'm just being honest, th- these are things that just fly right by <laughs> me unless they're terrible or incredible. Yeah, I would say let's give it, I would give it a seven. And I will defer to your judgment. Excellent work, hair and wigs. Perfect. And makeup. Now yep. we should really get into those performances. So let's talk about Norbert Leo Butts. I did not want to like him. <laughs> Why not? He's so charming. I, I actually don't find him very charming fascinating sometimes find him really sleazy like in other shows yeah like and i find him a little bit like yeah just like a used car salesman sometimes totally but in this show it actually works beautifully right (laughs) because i think you're supposed to not be sure whose side you're on right as far as edward and will is he a cool dude is he a douchebag we don't know Yeah, yeah exactly and i kind of liked that i right from the get-go Felt that way. Totally. So I actually think he did a wonderful job. I agree completely. I really like Norbert Leo Butts in this. In general, I like him. I think he's great. He he charms me. I like his kind of sleaziness. Right. I think he's a real nice singer as well. And I really enjoyed him in this. And you also like Butts. So this is perfect. And he does. And he has a butt. <laughs> no, but his last name, I mean. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I didn't even catch that. That's so funny. <laughs> Yes, yeah. my love of butts extends to Norbert <laughs> Leo butts. <laughs> uh, so that's good. <laughs> so out of out of ten playbills, how many monkeys would you give Mr. Butts? <laughs> like an eight. Yeah. I think. Eight sounds great. Let's move on to some of the other characters. Oh, there are other characters in this show? It <laughs> doesn't feel like it, but there are. Yeah. So his son, Will Bloom, is played by Bobby Steggert, who um, at the time was, I think, quite young. I had seen him in the Ragtime Revival as younger brother. Right. And he was quite good. He's very sweet and charming. And I think he he keeps that up in this show. Yeah. I think he's got a really nice singing voice. I think what he lacks, though, is his ability to sort of like storytell while he's singing. He sort of does that thing of like acting in between the phrases instead of on them. But that's my own personal opinion. And I think he has a nice soaring tenor voice. So so Billy Crudup plays this role in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big fan of Billy Crudup as a performer, as an actor. I think he's super underrated. And what I love about his performance in the movie is... He plays this super brooding, almost too serious son um, where you're like, man, dude, lighten up, take it back a notch. <laughs> so when he when he does embrace the storytelling at the very end as his dad is dying, that contributes so much to this feeling of, oh, tears, oh, heartbreaking, mm-hmm. seeing serious old Billy Crudup telling a stupid old story and bra- like about breaking his father out of the hospital is just incredible. Yes. Yeah. All of this to say, not wanting to draw one-to-one comparisons between the play and the movie, I think that a little more of those extremes would have really helped the end of the show land better than it did. Yes, that's a great point. So out of 10 playbills, I would give Bobby Steggert five plus one because he sings real nice, so six. Yeah, I think a six is appropriate. Absolutely. There's a couple other actors I'd love to mention real quick. Please. Um, so Sandra Bloom, the yep. wife of Edward, Kate Baldwin, gorgeous yes. voice, uh, clean scene work. I don't have a lot of bad to say about her. I'm a fan. Yeah, I am too. I'm just looking at her IBDB right now. Um, did like understudy and swing work in Thoroughly Modern Millie and Full Monty. Oh, I didn't realize. That's cool. Yeah. I love understudies and swings. They are yeah. unstoppable people. And maybe that's like that polish in her performance, you know? Yeah. Can only come from that. Used to having to have five tracks ready that she's never been on stage with before at any given time. Exactly. The other two folks I'd like to shout out are Josephine Bloom, who is Will's um, uh, wife. (laughs) Yep. Crystal Joy Brown. I thought she was very sweet. Um, She sort of played the, like, the encouraging presence, the person who pushes the plot forward i thought she did a really good job in that she was the current um current eliza yeah she on, um, is on hamilton yeah that's pretty cool good for her it's so that's cool a great trick. 
and I think exactly right for her. The other actor I'd like to shout out is Brad Oscar, who plays Amos Calloway, who's the circus um, ringleader, I guess. It's Danny DeVito. Circus master, Danny DeVito. He plays Danny yep. DeVito playing Amos Calloway. And yes. <laughs> and he, it's like he's a werewolf, right? That's the joke. Yep. But Brad Oscar, like does the same thing in every show he's in, which is like this really like shrieky, growly, talking, schlocky thing. And I love it. Oh, totally. I can't get enough. I saw him in Something Rotten and he was so excellent. Absolutely. You look at his um you look at his credits, doing a whole bunch of like understudy and then going in for Max Bialystock. Yes. Doing some spam a lot stuff, doing Fester in Adam's family. Yeah, like exactly what he Absolutely. should be doing. And then the ensemble does great work. Love ensemble members. Ensemble doing fantastic work. I wonder if one day we'll see an ensemble we really don't like. I can't imagine that happening, hey? I don't know. I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. <laughs> All right. So I think it's fair to say the cast is not the problem here. Yeah, I don't think so. Everyone's working their asses off. They're working so hard. They're saying the words. They're singing the right notes. I think they're doing it. Nine out of ten. I'd say nine out of ten as well. Let's collect some final thoughts and let's pass judgment. So, Paul. Yes. After having discussed all or most of the facets of this musical, what do you think? Should this have been made into a musical? I do not. I think that Big Fish should have been left as a really beautiful movie and as a novel. Mm. And I think that there was no value in turning it into a musical in this case. It didn't reach a wider audience, do you think? I don't think especially, especially given that freaking no one saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, real talk, uh, right? <laughs> yeah. And it was so... I. What do you think, Jill? I'm a little conflicted because I think I love Susan Stroman. So part of me is like, oh, I think she did everything she could. But if a person, yeah, if a person like her... And the team she assembled can't do it, then maybe you're right. Maybe we should just leave it as a movie and a book. Maybe let's not touch it. <laughs> yep. The movie does so much right in telling what's kind of a complicated story. You've got mm -hmm. two different timelines going on. And one of the timelines is a gross exaggeration of events that actually happened. Yes. You're juggling some complicated stuff that uses the medium of film very effectively to tell that story. Yes. I think there are some theatrical tools that are used well here to tell that same story. But in general, why not just embrace stories that the those theatrical tours are really well suited to? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Rather than trying to force a story into those theatrical tools. Yes. Wow. I think this might be the first one that, yeah. that we've said this about. This is absolutely the first one I've said this about. I'm a pretty big believer that... Most stories can be very efficiently told with music because music, the, the advantage that musical theater gives is it lets people talk about, lets characters talk about their personal belief, their personal journeys. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I don't even know if that's not necessary, <laughs> but it didn't enhance anything for me. Didn't yeah. enhance a thing. Yeah. That's a good way to look at it. Okay. Well, that's that section. Wah, wah. Yeah. So that's that <laughs> section. Maybe we should talk about the um, accolades and the nominations and all of the awards that this was nominated for. I think that's a great idea. So this is an interesting one because unlike a lot of the shows we've uh, talked about, this was certainly not a unanimous bomb across the board. A lot of people thought this was a nice show. They sure did. Even Variety called it a wholly satisfying show, meaningful, emotional, tasteful. It took some Tony Awards as well, didn't it? Or it got some Tony nominations. None. Total shout out. None! My bad! <laughs> None at all! Big Fish was shut out from the Tony Awards. Oof. Which I don't know if that's necessarily right. I don't think that's fair. I would, I would agree with that. 
But a couple of the things that were nominated in the same year, because context proves to be key when we're talking about flops. Absolutely. What was 2013 again? So actually it was eligible in 2014 because it was late in the year. Totally. So we had Gentleman's Guide. We had Bridges of Madison County. If then, we had a slew of new musicals. Like, I think there was like 10 new musicals. One, two, three. Beautiful. Bullets Over Broadway. Like, there were so many. Rocky. There were 12 original musicals that year. And it's so interesting, though, because with the exception of Gentleman's Guide, not many of those I would classify as over the top much better than Big Fish. Yeah. Aladdin was also eligible that year. Oh, yeah. And I'm kind of thinking that Aladdin must have taken a good chunk of the audience that would have gone to Big Fish. Yep, that makes sense. Tourists coming in wanting to see um, something based on something they saw in the theaters. Yeah. No question of that. There were also a lot of really amazing plays yep. and some revivals too. So there was Cabaret, Hedwig, Les Mis, and Violet. I was just going to mention the Les Mis revival was up. Yeah. Yeah. With friend of the podcast, Sam Hill. That's <laughs> with actual personal friend, Sam Hill. Yeah, actual That's personal true. friend, yep. not imaginary friend <laughs> in the room with us. It was actually a very busy year. Yeah. A very full year. And so it's really not surprising that um, Big Fish would have gone, you know, unnominated. The kind of salt in the wound, though, I think, yeah. for the the producers of Big Fish was probably that Susan Stroman was nominated, but for Bullets Over Broadway. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So it really kind of like... I'm sure it would not have felt super good for those producers oh. because then they're like, oh, it was our fault. Oh, like there yeah, was something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So kind of sad. I thought for sure maybe like lighting or yep. some sort of like design element would have been nominated. But So as always, um, the Tony nomination shutout proves to be kind of a final, final nail in the coffin and they post closing. So I think, I think we have all the information we need for the jury to make a decision. Ooh. All right, let's do it. Is this a flop? Is this a secret surprise bop? Or do we need to make it stop? Jillian Willems, where's your head? Um, I'm a bit torn because after having our conversation about, like, should this be a musical? And feeling, feeling like maybe it shouldn't have been. I'm a bit torn between flop and make it stop. Yeah. Because I don't think it was like nails on a chalkboard no. bad. So I'm kind of like, oh, maybe it was just a flop. And yep. maybe like a fun and innovative um, lower budget version would actually be better. I was going to say, here's a good way for me to decide whether it's a flop or whether it's a make it stop. If we were going to do a production of Big Fish, do you think we could make it good? Yeah, we could do it with like $5. I think we could too. So I think it's just a flop. I think so. But it's not unsalvageable. All right. Well, then let's... Say it. It's a flop. It's a flop. Um, so it's going to flop around, not unlike a fish. Oh, did it sink or swim? I should have asked that. It would flop around, not unlike a large sea creature. <laughs> <laughs> From the Jurassic period. From the Jurassic period. <laughs> Isn't that what they say in the movie? I don't know. I might be making it up. No, that sounds right. Yeah, it's like a super old yes. fish. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> oh my gosh. Did we do it? Did we talk about it? We did. Oh. Did we do it not all in the same room? We did, I think. Producer Daph, can, is that something we're going to be able to work with? Yes, it absolutely is. <laughs> um. Okay, Paul, what are we going to talk about next? I'm so excited because next week we are going to have the first ever actual friend of the podcast on the podcast. We're going to make sure he has a mic. <laughs> it's our dear, dear friend from childhood, Ryan Siegel. And we're going to talk about Star Mites. Get excited, oh y'all. Look it up. It's incredible. It's going to be fun. Is it anything like termites? It is... <laughs> <laughs> You're asking whether the musical Star Mites is anything like the insect termites. Correct. Like, yes and no. Anything it touches crumbles to the ground. <laughs> Star Mites <laughs> slash termites. <laughs> Join us next time, y'all. Thank you.
Hi everyone, this is producer Daphne speaking. Thank you all so much for joining us for Monkeys and Playbills, the show where we take a look at Broadway musicals that had 100 performances or fewer before closing. If you have a show that you'd like us to cover, you can get in touch with us at Monkeys and Playbills Pod on Instagram or by emailing monkeysandplaybillspod at gmail.com. Monkeys and Playbills is proud to be a Village Conservatory for Music Theater podcast. Original music for the show is provided by Paul DeGers, and the show is produced and edited by Daphne Finlayson. Thank you all so much for listening, and join us next week where we take on Starmites. <laughs>